let's welcome Matt Swanson, Matthew Swanson of Sync, which is Commissions Inc. Matt created the software architecture behind Commissions Inc. platform today. Today, Commissions Inc. has over 180 employees and provides software for real estate agents who have had over 200,000 closings in the last 12 months. Wow. Before joining Sync, he was the CTO of HBN Interactive and Directive Marketing Technologies at Career Builder, where he served for over eight years. Matt worked to develop emerging partnerships with companies such as Disney and Facebook, in addition to SEO initiatives. He also served as a senior software engineer with Career Builder, and before then, he was a consultant with Accenture. There, he led development efforts with clients such as Bank of America, AT&T, and the Office of Com Comptroller of the Currency. In his free time, Matthew is hashtagging hashtag BGE. For those in the know, that means grilling masterpieces on the big green egg. Let's welcome Matthew. Awesome. Cool. Well, th thanks for having me today, everybody. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to everybody. And you know, I was listening to Kevin's talk, and actually, we did send our customers on a cruise. So um, it was quite interesting, but I'll, I'll save that story for another day. Um, so first off, I just want to say thanks to David for, for this venue. Um, in, tw in 2011, when we started Commissions Inc., this venue didn't exist, and there wasn't really an opportunity for SaaS entrepreneurs to come in and, and network and get to know each other and just have a, a lessons learned opportunity. So this is really exciting. So David, thank you for this opportunity to do this. So, so today I'm going to tell you the story about how Three co-founders from Marietta, Georgia, started in a small house off the Marietta Square in 2011. And five years later, the business sold for $240 million to a publicly traded company. So I'm excited to tell that story today. So first, a little about you and a little about me. Um, how many people in here are engineers? So you write software, you write code. And how many people are on the business side, where you're just more on the business side? So, I'm an engineer, so I have my notes. So, I'm gonna... so a little bit about me. This was me before Sync. <laughs> so, I, as you know, startups can be stressful. Launching new businesses can be stressful, and um, it's a it's a great experience, but it's not easy. So, I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I have a logistics and transportation degree. I uh, worked for Accenture out of college for a couple of years and did some consulting work and tried to figure out, like, what, what did I really want to do? Um, at that time, the Internet was really starting to boom in the late 90s. I went to work for Headhunter.net as a web, de web developer. I built uh, the e-commerce system and forms that allowed job posters to post jobs on, on Headhunter.net. Eventually, it was sold to CareerBuilder.com. So I worked for CareerBuilder for about eight years, doing things from the the... the the job search engine to you know the marketing team working with Facebook. We launched the Facebook Apps Initiative. We were one of Facebook's first partners to spend a million dollars on ad spend with Facebook building applications in 2008. So in 2000, uh, after I left in 2008, I had an opportunity to work with Dwayne Legate and Brian O'Neill. These are two guys that I knew from Career Builder. Dwayne had a vision for Commissions Inc. The vision for Sync, I'm going to refer to it as Sync because we've rebranded, but Dwayne had a vision for Sync that the real estate industry is very segmented. You know, people are working for real estate companies. They have their own independent brokerages. The real estate companies are providing tools, but those tools, they're, they're good, but in some areas, they're not quite as good. So a lot of real estate agents have to go out and buy their own tools. So they might be spending, you know, $250 here, $100 there, $500 there. So Dwayne's goal for our company was really to, to build a system that was a one, one price that had all the functionality and features that the, all these small tools would have. And as we innovated and build new things, we, wouldn't, we weren't going to charge our clients any more money. And I say clients there for a very specific reason. When we started building the business, we were targeting top elite teams, people that sold 50 to 100 transactions per year. So if you think about it, a customer... You know, you hear customer service, customer service. Like, customers typically are, you know, you'll go at a fast food restaurant at Chick-fil-A and you'll be a customer, or you'll go to Burger King. But for what we wanted to build, client was critical. Dwayne was very, 
very adamant that we work with clients. These people would be spending, you know, fifteen hundred to seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a month with us. You know, a client is somebody that you're a client of your accountant, you're a client of an attorney. So we wanted to make sure that our clients felt like they were really getting what they were paying for. So Brian O'Neill, I'd worked with him at Headhunter.net uh, as we built the job posting forms. Um, super sharp guy. He knows batch processing systems better than anybody I've met. Dwayne had a, has a brilliant sales mind. Dwayne can see market opportunity and vision unlike anybody I've ever met. He can connect to clients and show them the vision that he's laid out. So we all came together in 2011 to make this happen. So really, what is Sync? Sync is a, a, a platform for real estate agents. Think about, David put it this way, marketing automation targeted to real estate agents. So Commissions Inc. brings basically a system together that allows real estate agents just to focus on selling homes, not worrying about the technology behind it. So we have a SEM team that manages all the ad spend and pay-per-click for the clients. You know, we're touching upwards of 200 to 500,000 keyword campaigns a day with Google through automation. There's a lot happening that we're doing to, to tap into the local MLS, to build the client's website, to drive traffic to their sites, to get them to convert, signing them up, connecting them to the agents and brokers, and ultimately facilitating a transaction, much like John was talking about earlier. So engineering the infrastructure, what does that mean? So in, in, in 2011, you know, AWS had been around for probably seven years at the time. Um, it was still kind of in, in its infancy, and we had learned at CareerBuilder a lot of the infrastructure we had was in physical data centers. So what we wanted to do is, at AWS, we looked at it, but we were kind of like, you know, we really want that hand-holding and a, really an extension of our team. So we went to Rackspace. So Rackspace was our preferred vendor from the start, and they provided not only the, the hardware infrastructure we need, but also the operational expertise. Brian and I were software guys. We didn't want to focus on the hardware part. So we just looked to Rackspace to make sure that, that they could provide that service for us. So in 2011, it was just Brian and I building the product. And we were like, you know, we really have to start scaling our team. So how do we do that? So we were like, you know, let's, we talked to Dwayne. We got an approval for an intern. So we were like, we're going to go to Georgia Tech. We got in with Career Services. We're going to interview a few people, and hopefully one of them will join our company and help us start building this product. So we go into Georgia Tech. We go down to Career Services that first day. We look on the big board that has all the employers that are on campus interviewing. We walk in, and this is the slide that shows. It's HBN Media, and it's Victoria's Secret. And I remember looking at Brian, and I was like, nobody's ever going to come work for HBN Media. Like, this is, this is not good. But that day, we actually had three interviews scheduled. Justice Blasco, Hong Lee, and John Dugan. And thankfully, after we interviewed the three of them, they were all phenomenal students. Each of them in their own right had done amazing things, even in college. Justice Blasco had built MP3 management with using a PHP CRM type system to manage all his music while he was in high school. Hong Lee was building Firefox plugins at 14 years old. And John Dugan was building iOS and Android's, Android apps as a freshman in college. So we knew these three guys that we had interviewed were really the, t the top guys that could possibly help join our company. So we go, back to the, we go back to the office and talk to Brian, and he's like, hey, we need to hire one intern. I was like, no, we have to hire all of them. So we extended an offer to all three of them. So John and, John and Hong accept the offer. So they're, they, ex they decide to come on. They're coming on to work the first day. They show up to our office. They actually circled the office three times before they decided to get out and come to the front door to see if it was really our company. In May 2011, our product was just getting off the ground. We, we were going through, you know, we had our interns. We started building. We didn't quite yet have customers. Um, I opened up my devotional that day, and this was the slide I read. And it says, there, is, there will be no limit to what you can accomplish. So I, I show you this because there is encouragement in, in all things that you do. Each one of you, as you're launching your business, you're going through hard times. It is not easy to start a software company. It sounds glorious and it sounds glamorous. And when your friends see that, oh, you're at the tech village and you're part of a startup, it's a great opportunity. But it's not easy. It's really, really hard. And I just wanted to encourage each one of you here today that as you're building your companies, don't give up. Do not quit. My grandmother grew up in Peachtree Garden Apartments few miles up the road. Today it's a Costco and a Moe's and a whole big thing. And she always told me, do not give up. 
Do not quit what you start. Now, there were a lot of times as we we're building this company where I wanted to quit, and I didn't want to do it, and it was hard. And those times came later in 2011 when Dwayne came to me and Brian, and he said, hey, guys, I'm not even taking a salary right now. And by the way, like, I need to cut your salary by 50%. And I don't know when that's going to stop. Like, you're going to take a salary cut, and it might be two months, it might be six months, it might be a year, it might be forever. I, I don't know. And that was a, a real turning point for me that we had to make a decision. Like, are we going to stick with this startup and do it, or are we not? So fast forward to beginning of 2012. Basically, we're sitting here. We've got our new office. We have Sync GHQ 2.0. Does anybody know what GHQ means? It's our galactic headquarters, right? So we throw all the tech guys in this office. The sales team's in the other office. Team, I mean team, it's like three people, right? So we're both working and building. And, and then in 2012, we're starting to get customers. We're starting to get clients. But then we realize, hey, we're, we're starting to outgrow these spaces, so we need to come together into a new location. So we found an office space off Delk Road in Marietta. And by the end of 2012, we were at about 18 to 22 people. Our clients were starting to grow, and, and we're basically getting you know, a new opportunity. And this was another pivotal point for me personally where I, I was under a lot of stress, like trying to figure out, like, can I make this happen? I just had my third kid. I'm focusing on growing my family, doing a startup. And I go in to talk to Dwayne, and he says to me, you know, I just watched that movie Courageous. And I don't know if you guys remember that movie a few years back, but you know, we had a conversation, and I was like, you know what? I cannot give up. I cannot stop what we've started. So then fast forward another year. In 2013, we're in our new office space. It's 4,000 square feet. It's great. Uh, I thought we'd never fill up this space. So the company continues to grow. We're adding more people. And then in 2013, Dwayne comes to us and says, we're going to focus our company on a, on, on a theme, right? So I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Miracle, but the movie Miracle is an amazing story in 1980 U.S. hockey team that had no chance to beat the Russians and win the gold medal, and they did it. And every person that starts at our company watches this movie. Every person that starts at our company understands how hard it was for that team and those boys to come together to build a company. And that's this type of focus and philosophy we had at our company to try to rally our team together to build what we wanted to build for Sync. Fast forward to 2016, we were acquired by a public company, uh, Fidelity National Financial. They're the number one title insurance company in the United States. They couldn't be a more perfect fit for us because they're already doing title insurance on the back end of all the transactions happening. We're on the front end generating the leads and, and all the good stuff. So I go through the company history quickly just to establish a baseline for everybody. This is one of our field day pictures that we did at the Atlanta Battery with our team. Our, our team today is actually not 180, it's 225 people. So we've gone from three to 225 in just seven years. So really the tech behind sync. <clears throat> Sorry guys. So as we were building sync, I would always say to Dwayne, Whatever you think that's going to take a day to build will probably take a month, and whatever you think is going to take a month will probably take a day. And I think most tech guys can equate that when you're working with your various product people and CEOs. That's something that we always had to, to really focus on is, you know, the product team sometimes would want to come in and say, oh, it's going to take this long. Well, just put it in the hands of the engineers and let the engineers say actually how long it's going to take. So uh, we always had a mantra at headhunter.net, fast, vast, and accurate. We wanted the fastest system, the most accurate system, and something that was vast. So we would follow lean development principles, get the solution 80% done, get it out into the marketplace, and get feedback from the users. I always use the Microsoft Word example. You know, if you're building Microsoft Word, I mean, everybody in here probably uses Google Docs or Word or something, right? But there's really only four or five things you do. You open a file, you write some information, you bold it, you italicize it, and you print it. I mean, you don't probably are going to put a pivot table from Excel into a Word document, but if you look at all that extra functionality that goes into Word and all the time spent, you're better to build those five features, deploy them to production, get feedback from your users, and understand how they're going to use your product. So how do, how do you get behind the technology that you're going to use to build your company? So this is a, a great slide I like to show. There's so many technologies out there, right? So is it Ruby? Is it Python? Is it Node.js? Like, what is it going to be? Well, the short answer is I would say it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter because whatever your team knows, whatever they're good at, 
that's what I would say to you. There's a quote from one of my old managers I worked with at Career Builder, Colin Field. And his quote was, all the information generated on the server at the end of the day, no matter what technology it's in, all it does is generate a text file and send it to the client. So your browser is just looking at text, whether it went through whatever it took to get it to that point, whatever you can get it to the client, the fastest and the leanest, that's what you should do. So we went with the Microsoft stack, just because that's what we knew at Career Builder. It's probably against the grain for a, a lot of people in 2018, but you know, it's one of those things that we, that's what we knew and that's what we were good at. Today our platform is serving up over 400 million object requests a month with an average response time of less than 200 milliseconds. We wanted our, our system to be fast. Our SQL database is running three terabytes of RAM with an EMC VNX array with 25 terabytes of data. We do 50,000 50, transactions per second in SQL Server. Most people don't get close to that. So how did we build our product early on? So how do we build, how do we build the product early on? So Brian O'Neill, our CTO, had a vision. And his vision was, what if we use our own product? We need to have a ticketing system for our, our developers. Our client service team needs to be able to manage our clients. We're building a CRM so our real estate broker and agents can manage their leads. So what if we used our product and our technology team on a daily basis managed all their tickets? What if our client service team managed our clients? Since we have a single tenant, multi-instance, multi single instance, multi-tenant environment, all we had to do is spin up a domain name for SyncGHQ to manage our tickets, for mysync.com to manage our clients. This way our engineers are in there every day using our product to manage their day-to-day -day work. Our client service team knew our product better than they probably ever would if they were out in Salesforce using it. They're using MySync every day to manage clients. So that was a philosophy that Brian had early on that we really tried to apply to make sure our team really knew what they were doing. So data integration and MLS. This is a huge challenge for our business from a scaling standpoint. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the multiple listing service, but we work with hundreds of multiple listing service vendors in different areas all across the US and Canada. Normalizing the data, you know, looking at all the data around an MLS system is huge for us. Every MLS impl implements data differently. There's a standard called RETS, which is basically an XML standard, but that standard can be applied in number of ways by every MLS. So how do you normalize all that data in and make it coherent? So here's an example. These are three fields, beds, bath, and price. So if you look at these gray boxes, this is how various MLSs present data to us. Some MLSs call it 1815. That's the name of the column. It's in position 55. So this is just a small example of the normalization challenge that Sync has to run 24 by 7, 365 to pull in 7 million active properties for sale in the United States and Canada. So this was a huge piece to our business. So seven tech lessons learned. So the first lesson is you can do more with less. You really can do way more than you realize with what you have. And I, I give an example of this. I, I said earlier we did 50,000 transactions per second in a 25 terabyte SQL database. Up until last December, we had a part-time DBA managing that environment. Part-time, part-time. The second thing is consistent daily action. Dwayne Legate, our co-founder, co got everybody onto the Rockefeller Habits book. There's a premise in the Rockefeller Habits that you should have a daily stand-up meeting. We picked an odd time according to the book. Ours every day was at 9.09. 9.09 a.m., daily stand-up, entire company. Started when we were 15 people in 2012. We finally had to end it at about 120 people about two years ago on a daily basis. We still have it every week with the entire company. But believe it or not, we were meeting daily with 100 people and the meeting was 15 minutes. What are the choke points? What are the vision of the company for the day? What are things that everybody needs to know about? You know, a lot of times those messages get lost in email, but when you're having a daily meeting, you can, you can really proliferate that information a lot easier. Wants versus needs. 
Wants versus needs is, is huge. Dwayne would always say to us, if it's a want, think about it. Do you really need to spend the money to do that? If it's a need and you have to do it, then do it. But really think about if it's a nice to have or if it's going to stop you from getting your work done. The fourth thing is don't be afraid to go into an existing market and be leaner and more nimble than your competition and do it better than they can. A startup of three people or even 10 people can pivot and deploy a whole lot faster than a company that has 1,000 or 2,000 employees. It's just a heck of a lot easier. I, I used to give an analogy when I was at CareerBuilder. A startup is like pushing a rubber band ball around this room. But if you're a huge company, to pivot that organization, it's like moving the globe. Like it's, very, it's about impossible to do. So the startup has a, a competitive advantage just from that standpoint. The fifth thing tech lesson learned is go where your competition isn't. When we started in 2011, one of our other competitors had been around for four years. They had a large market share, but they didn't have any native iOS and Android apps. So from the start, we started building iOS and Android. That was huge for us. Our clients loved it. Number six is infrastructure partners. And I, I can't I cannot focus on this one enough. For us, it is all about the relationships. Our relationship with Rackspace, our relationship with SendGrid, Twilio, Rigor, all the people, the people behind those companies, that is what has allowed us to do what we've done. While our team was small, we really got to know our, our infrastructure partners. And I mean, I look at an example, Brian, our CTO just got married. Rackspace sent him a wedding gift. Now, I don't want to offend AWS, but I don't know if they're sending a wedding gift to our CTO, right? So, I mean, getting to know your vendors is huge. It's a huge thing. And the number seven is best practices. Getting your teams on the same page. Putting in simple things from a technical standpoint that as new employees come on, that they can follow your processes and procedures, whether that's establishing these four columns or in every database table, whether it's, you know, we're going to use Slack and this is how it's going to be rolled out. Just putting in simple things that, the, that the, team, the team members can use. So now just a couple things about, you know, without, I'm, I'm presenting our, some of our story today, but really without our, our people, this story is not possible. So I gathered a few quotes from some of our team just to kind of show, you know, what Sync's about and what they've learned over our journey of the last seven years. So Brian O'Neill, there are two types of developers, those that love to do technology and that, those that love to get things done. And we've seen this with multiple people on our team sometimes. Sometimes people just like tech. They don't necessarily like solving a problem. And for us, it was about solving the problems. John Dugan, our mobile, lead mobile developer, even hacky code can still be mission critical, so keep that in mind when cutting corners. A lot of times as engineers, we think, oh, we'll make this quick solution, and in 10 years, it won't be done. Well, I was talking to my buddy probably a year ago at CareerBuilder, and I've been gone from there for eight years. And he said, well, that stuff you wrote in 2004, it's still running. So a lot of times you don't think about that. Your stuff's going to be running for a long, long time. Nate Jones, <clears throat> who's our direct, senior director of technology, don't be afraid to break things, but be ready to fix it and have a backup plan. An example I think of of this is actually from Brian, and he'll probably throw me up. He'll probably be really mad at me for telling this story, but in 2004, he was editing all the users at CareerBuilder in a SQL window. He had Query Manager, he had Management Studio open. He'd highlighted all the data. He was about to execute a query. Praise the Lord, he had actually typed in begin trans before he actually ran the query. He highlighted the data. A squirrel falls out of the ceiling. No, no, no joke. Squirrel falls out of the ceiling. Everybody jumps up from their cubes. One guy grabs a trash can. He's chasing it. The other guy has a shovel. Like, it was chaos. So finally, after 10 minutes, it died down. Brian comes back to his desk and hit execute. Well, he had only partially run his, his statement, and he dropped the entire user table. Gone. All gone. But he had, he had, be, he had typed begin trans, so all he had to do was roll back. So just make sure you have a backup plan. That's Nate's quote. Uh, Mike Gullo, VP of product, building a solution to solve a problem brings greater returns than doing something for short-term delight. You know, I, I look at the, the whole... Are you building a vitamin or a painkiller? Like, what, do you, what, kind of, what is your product fulfilling? Is it doing something to just make your clients' lives a little bit better or to make your clients' lives significantly better? 
I love this quote. This is Vishal, but it's actually Dwayne. So I'm going to give credit to Dwayne Legate. But we're all in sales. That question Kevin asked earlier, who's in marketing? Everybody in this room is in marketing. If you work for a company, you're in marketing. Doesn't matter if you're in tech. Doesn't matter if you're in sales, billing, whatever the part is, you're playing a part to reduce churn and keep your clients. So three key takeaways I have is wants versus needs. And I actually have four, but the do more with less to me is huge. Like, you can do way more than you realize with what you have. Two, fast, fast, and accurate. And three, speed is our only competitive advantage. I know I've heard some presentations um, here at the Village where culture is your only competitive advantage, and I agree with that too, but I, I think speed is a, is a key one and something that we've really tried to focus on as we built Commissions, Inc., So kind of just to wrap up, I'd just like to encourage each one of you. You know, each one of you are on a different part of your journey as you're building your product. Um, it's not going to be easy. You know, things aren't easy. Things that are successful are not easy to do. I mean, talk to David in detail about building Pardot. It sounds great. It sounds amazing. But the day-to-day -day grind and what they had to do to make that happen is not easy. What you're doing is not easy. But do not quit and do not give up. Wonderful, wonderful. I've got about 50 questions, but I'll see if anyone has, uh, has one or two on any questions. Yeah, I, I got one here. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned you had the story of growing from you know, 3 to 15 to 100 plus. How did you keep that communication between product and technology to make sure you're aligned on what are the must-have things to build versus all the cool things sure. to build? Well, the short answer is it's really easy. We didn't even have product until 2015. So, I, I, I mean, I guess like tech just did it. I mean, literally it was, you know, one key thing I didn't talk about is our private Facebook group for our clients was critical to our business. That was their voice. That was their forum for problems, for better, for worse. And when we did it right and we solved the problem right, we heard about it. And if we did something wrong, we heard about it. But our clients would jump in and solve other clients' problems that they were having. Hey, you didn't know you could do this? So we weren't, our support wasn't even having to get involved. Our other clients were jumping in and that community was making it happen. So, but to answer your question about product, say it one more time, sorry. <laughs> Between product and technology, as yeah, so, growing and getting bigger. Okay, so that's what I was getting at. So early on, right, I mean, you think about, you have no product, you're building it, it's all cup holders, right? So your client wants this, Client would ask for it in Facebook, would come on a napkin over to tech, we'd build it and deploy it. So that was really as simple as it was. Now, is there technical debt because of that now at some levels? Yes, but that's kind of how it worked back in the early days. What was your strategy for the infrastructure partners on kind of building those relationships? Because you know, a lot of the smaller startups, you know, you're nothing until you have something. And, and at times, you get raked over the coals because your stuff goes down and you don't have those relationships. So how would you guys build that? Right. I mean, I, I think the, the key for us is the consistent weekly action, right? So it, at Rackspace in the early days, we were just a regular client. But we made a concerted effort to get to know Alan Bounds, who's no longer on our account, but Alan was awesome. He's an expert Windows sysadmin. We got to know him personally through the phone calls we're having, asking questions, finding out, oh, where are you going on vacation? What are you doing? Like, trying to build a relationship. I mean, how does that scale out beyond, you know, dozens of developers? It's a lot harder, but that's what we did early on, things like that. Um, so at what rate did you grow from, you know, zero... Zero customers to one to five to ten to so, whatnot. This is where, as a co-founding engineer, I'm so different from the sales front. Our first conference we went to was in March 2011. We had an opportunity. Dwayne had an opportunity to speak at a real estate conference, and we went and presented our MVP to the group, and we sold 40 people, 40 customers. Had we finished the product yet? No. Did we close some of those customers? Yes. Did we have to ask them if we could bill them every month? Can we bill you? No. Can we bill you this month? No. Finally, in August of 2011, we could bill eight people. 
and six of them asked for a refund the next week. <laughs> so th there's a lot of challenge as you begin to sell the product. But from that point in August of 2011, sales really kicked off into 2012, and, and things just kind of started snowballing. We actually didn't have inbound sales. Or sorry, we didn't have, everything was inbound. So no outbound sales to the company up until probably a year ago. Does that answer your question? Okay. One, one more question. When you did your all hands uh, employee meetings, how did you keep it? How did you keep it to fifteen minutes? Where you're hitting what's core for that day with your with your employees and your team? Yes. Yeah, so so talking to the Rockefeller habits, one of the principles, and I don't think I talked about it, is a daily top five. So every team member up to their manager would have the top five things you're working on for that day the top five things you accomplished, and any choke points you have. So that email went out every morning before the meeting to your manager. And then in the meeting, any choke points that you're having, like in the meeting, we might only say, this is the number one thing I'm doing today. And if there were no issues with it, no discussion. If there were choke points that people had, they would get brought up in front of everybody and discussed at that time. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's give it up for Matthew Swanson. What a story.